Our next speaker is going to be Dr. Andrew Hess, I believe. And uh, while uh, Robert's getting him queued up, I'll just tell you these cards, I'm reading these cards. I remember in church once upon a time, I have to be careful about reading cards. I get a little bit sort of paranoid about it. Uh, we'd have these visitor's cards that you fill out, throw it in a collection tray when it went by. I would fill them out and I'd put stuff on there like John Elway. And then the guy up there would start reading them. Well, John Elway's with us this morning. So sometimes it, it was funny for him, but I don't I, I don't see the, the humor in it from my standpoint today. So Dr. Hess, you're there, okay? I think yep. you've got to upload, uh, upload your uh, uh, presentation and we will let you take off with it when you get that done. Great, I'll just share my screen real quick. You can see that okay? Yes, we can, it's all yours. Great, all right, well, Good afternoon and hello from New Zealand. Um, thanks for the opportunity to um, talk at this update. And um, just wanted to say that I, I was planning on briefly uh, elaborating a, a little bit about my background, but in the interest of time, I think I'll just uh, jump straight into things. Um, I will also say that this will be a little bit New Zealand centric. Um, but the concepts can be applied uh, to the, the U.S. livestock industry as well. So in New Zealand, uh, sheep genetic improvement is based on two main indices. Um, one of them is the maternal worth index, um, and the other one is the New Zealand terminal worth index. And so the goal here is to estimate the genetic merit of an individual or the breeding value. And this is indicative of an individual's worth as a parent. And Randy briefly mentioned um, it, while he was speaking uh, this morning uh, that we also have some, some health traits particularly related to um, gastrointestinal parasites. Um, so as part of an add-on to the terminal worth index, you can also get a breeding value um, for warm fecal egg count um, in order to um, reduce the impact of gastrointestinal parasites um, in your flock. So the advantage of uh, genetic selection is that it allows for continual improvement that is sustained after selection stops. Um, and on the right side of these slides here, you can see a couple of genetic trends, one for each of our, our main indices. Um, and, and you can see that uh, we have had gradual improvement in these indices over the last 25 years. Um, this was originally based on uh, pedigree. Um, however, around 2010, uh, genomics started to be incorporated into our breeding practices. And it's a little hard to tell, but you can actually see an uptick in the rate of genetic gain since um, genomics has been implemented. The, this um, improvement has led to more productive sheep. So over the last 30 years, um, we have observed a 53 decrease in the number of sheep in New Zealand. However, um, lamb production has only decreased 9%. And this is largely due to um, just having more productive, more efficient uh, animals. An advantage of this is that um, we also have observed a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions over the last uh, 30 years. Um, part of this is due to just the stocking load being lower, but if you also look at it on a per ton of production uh, basis, we see that there is also 
a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, which really highlights the fact that these animals are in fact more um, productive, more efficient. Um, genetic improvement can broadly be uh, categorized into two different types. One of them is genetic selection. Um, so this use, utilizes pedigree and without phenotype full sibs get um, the, the same breeding value. This sort of selection relies heavily on providing or on proving schemes to get reliable estimates of genetic merit. Um, and thus the uh, generation interval is limited by uh, phenotype collection on individuals or its relatives. And these are typically siblings or offspring. The advantage that genomic selection provides is that because it uses um, a higher resolution, so genomic information through um, single nucleotide polymorphisms, we are able to capture genetic differences between our full sibs. And because of this, we can make selection decisions based on genomics earlier in life. And so our generation interval is now limited uh, by sexual maturity. Um, so this is one way that using genomics can improve our rates of genetic gain. Genomic selection is accomplished through um, the use of uh, SNP chips or, or these uh, single nucleotide polymorphism arrays. Um, and ag research is heavily involved in uh, the development of these SNP chips that are used in the New Zealand sheep industry. And these can be broken into two different categories. One of them is a high density SNP array, which is primarily used um, for research and development purposes, um, but it is also commonly used to genotype um, highly influenced sires, for example, to get um, better resolution on their uh, genetic merit. The other uh, category are low density SNP arrays. Um, and the idea here is really to provide um, the genotype information on the individuals that's more cost effective for the industry. And one thing that I do want to highlight is the fact that these are under continual improvement. Um, and one of the things that I've been focusing on here at Ag Research is identifying causative variants through the use of whole genome sequence data, um, which has the potential to improve genomic selection while keeping the costs of genotyping low. Just as a, a quick example, I'll, I'll be going through kind of a comparison um, for tenderness as measured by uh, shear force using either our high density SNP chip, which has 600,000 markers on it, or whole genome sequence. Um, and you can see here, this is what's called a Manhattan plot. So along the X axis, we have our chromosomes, and on our y-axis, we have a p-value related to the strength of association um, between that genotype and the um, trait of interest, so tenderness. And we can see a, a few regions of the genome are very strongly uh, associated um, with tenderness. However, when we um, increase our density to whole genome sequence, we identify more regions that are associated with this trait. And if, for example, you look at uh, CAS, so calpostatin, um, you can see in light green here provides a contrast between the HD results or high density results and whole genome sequence. So we do find stronger associations with our whole genome sequence data, um, which these markers can be placed on our SNP chips in order to provide more accurate um, estimates of breeding values. Um, 
just kind of summarizing these results, there are seven regions that were identified from our genome-wide association study that um, explained roughly 10% of the genetic variants. Um, so targeting specifically these regions may um, improve our ability to predict the uh, uh, performance of our individuals. And that's in fact what we see. So this um, table here compares our results, um, our prediction accuracy, so our ability to accurately rank our animals using just the high density information or high density plus um, additional SNPs in these significant regions. And we do see quite a substantial increase in our prediction accuracy. To summarize, um, in general, uh, genomic selection allows for more accurate uh, differences to be estimated between our individuals and allows for different levels of emphasis to be placed on regions of the genome with larger effects. This allows for more, and it allows for more accurate selection of individuals earlier in life. Um, when looking at causative variants, um, these directly capture the genetic variation that's associated with the trait, and this can lead in an in, to an increased accuracy of an individual's genetic merit. Um, and this is particularly important for crossbreeding schemes because while tagging SNPs, so just normal SNPs that are thrown on uh, the, the SNP chips that rely on LD between the marker and the, the region of interest um, may differ be, between breeds, the causative variants are less likely to. Um, so it's more consistent between the different, um, the breeds in, in your uh, selection program. More uh, um, using causative variants also more accurately capture effects from regions of the genome that influence many traits. And this is particularly important because as I mentioned earlier in the talk, we select on an index. And so having that um, increased accuracy will help across a number of traits. Um, we can also develop strategies to account for unfavorable antagonisms uh, between our different traits. So I just talked about how we can improve things from the genomic side, but improvement can also be made through um, novel phenotypes. Um, and one thing that I'm interested in, in focusing on once I, I make it across the pond is uh, sustainability and rangeland livestock systems. Um, and, and so the way that I see it is uh, it's really broken down into three broad categories including economic viability, social acceptance, and environmental impact. And then I also have some, some broad level or high level uh, phenotypes that we might, or that I'm interested in looking at, such as uh, breeding for robust performance. So animals that can perform well on a range of environments, improved feed efficiency, so animals that make the most use of the available re resources, um, as well as animal health and welfare. Um, so animals that are less burdened by a disease and better suited to the climate and thus need less intervention. Animals that are better suited for the terrain and climate and animals with lower greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so animals that have, um, for example, reduced methane emissions. And just want to note in terms of the land use behavior. So Mozart this morning uh, had mentioned that, you know, there's a favorable genetic correlation between production efficiency and um, water use. And so that that's an example uh, of land use behavior. It, I also want to mention that there usually is a positive correlation or favorable correlation between feed efficiency and greenhouse gas emissions. And so all of these things do kind of tie into each other. 
with that, um, thanks for your time. Um, I'm definitely interested in hearing any challenges that you have. So feel free to contact me um, at my ag research email um, if you want to get a hold of me before I start in July. And thanks. I'll 